I'm Georgia Raisman, and I'm here this morning on the Monday Scoop with Tom DiVincentis, who is a New York City-based veterinarian, born in the middle of the country in Ohio, and he's written a book called Tales of the City, which I have right here. A, a very charming book about his, uh, his adventures and the pet's adventures in being a veterinarian for he in here, here for many decades. And we're going to talk today about the trials and tribulations and joys of being a pet owner as we get older. And it's really two audiences. It's an audience of people who are in their early 60s, late 50s, who have pets and people who are maybe a, almost a generation older than that. How do pets keep us healthy? How do we help keep them healthy? And I guess we all, we all know about how we can keep our pets healthy. I mean, we go to veterinarians if we're diligent and we keep them, we keep ahead, we keep maybe pet insurance, we can talk about that. But think, think about it from our perspective. How do pets keep us healthy, Tom? Tom, I should say, was uh, born and bred in Ohio, went to Ohio State Veterinary School, and has been living in Manhattan since he graduated. Mm -hmm. Long that. time. Long time, yeah. yeah. So yeah. How, do pelts, how do pelts keep us healthy? Um, well, let's see, I have a new pet, and you're talking about people in one generation or another generation, and I've realized that this pet could outlive me. Um, and the other day I was walking, and although I think I give a fa fairly youthful appearance for my age, this man came up to me and said, oh, what a nice thing, uh, an old man with a new dog, that'll keep you going, that'll oh, keep gee. you busy. <laughs> So I said thank you, but um, you know that dog gets you out of the house every day, establishes a routine if you don't have one. I still work, so I have one. Uh, but uh, for many people, it's you know gets them out three times a day. Uh, somebody else to think about in their life if they're alone. And there are many people in New York who live alone with their pets, and that's you know that is a, an issue and something that people have to worry about. And um, not that many people have come to me and said, what should I do? I, I have had a few people say, will I take their pet when, when they pass on? But, you know, that's kind of impossible. Um, I have a client who is 84 and she lost a cat. and She already still had a cat, but she got a new kitten. And she has prepared in advance by um, making a $40,000 contribution to a charity that will at some point take that cat. Whether they rehouse that cat in another house or whether it lives there in some kind of cat zoo, I don't know. But so there are, there are charities then who can accommodate cats as bequests, sort of bequests? Yeah, there I are. That's what, that's cats what and dogs she's done. Um, what about horses? I mean, you, you're an equine enthusiast yourself. And I, I, I actually, on Route 22, there's a place called Lucky Horse or something for orphan horses. How does that come about? Well, it's really off topic a bit. Uh, but. Horses live long lives. Um, they can live to be 40. Um, they can be useful in their lives until they're in their 20s. Um, but a lot of uh, people who, who use them, uh, once they reach a certain point where they're not quite as usable, have to house them. Mm -hmm. So um, they have horse farms for that. I mean, mm -hmm. instead of paying $2,500 a month to board your, ho your horse while you're using it and jumping on it or fox hunting with it or doing whatever your discipline is, once that horse ages out, these people, the good ones, are committed to spending $700 a month, send their horse away to live out the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's all about. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a good friend of mine, horse is 18, he um, was the leader of the fox hunt, and there were no, there is no live fox. It's called drag hunting. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. no animals are yeah. hurt or killed. Yeah. Um, his house, horse became 18, and he was able to uh, donate it to a group that does work with um, veterans and with um, you know children who have learning disabilities mm -hmm. because of the th a therapy horse. Mm -hmm. So the uh, horses can be used as therapy horses yeah. even at that age. Oh yes, I especially at that age because mm -hmm. th that work is Quieter. walking, mm -hmm. maybe trotting, mm -hmm. not very much at all. Mm -hmm. no. So, so the horse has a use, a mm -hmm. nice old horse. Mm -hmm. Horses are used to working. People say horses should work. Mm -hmm. That's a nice thing. The horse mm -hmm. has use. And can it do trail walking and, and cantering and stuff like that? Yeah, just sure. not, they just can, not they hunting. They can do that. I mean, we have older riders who 
they don't want to jump a fence, they mm -hmm. don't want to gallop through the countryside, and mm -hmm. they do what's called hilltopping or lower level fox hunting where, mm -hmm. I mean, my original teacher is 77. Mm -hmm. She goes out every Wednesday and every Sunday and she rides in what they call third flight mm -hmm. and, um, you know, walks along and trots along and, mm -hmm. and enjoys that group, mm -hmm. that camaraderie. And the horse can do that up until fairly... I've, I've, I've been just like, knocked out by horses who are following me when I was fox hunting, uh, going at a mad, mad clip, and I turn around and say to the person behind me, and how old is your horse? And I say, 25. Mm -hmm. I almost thought, maybe it's cruel to make a 25-year-old mm -hmm. horse do that. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. you know, right now, I have a horse who's 10, mm -hmm. and it seems to be the perfect age, not, not mm -hmm. flighty, and, and still very strong. Mm -hmm. so but getting back to smaller sort of domestic domestic animals, cats and dogs, and, and birds. I mean, birds that can be long lives too, I gather, 25, 20? No, parrots, par 50, parakeets, 75. 50, really. mm -hmm. pa parakeets, I think you get, you're lucky if you get eight. Mm -hmm. But um, oh, well, you shouldn't say that to my son. He has a peach-faced lovebird, which he is hoping will live 18 years, but years. He has one? He has one. He's the other lovebird. I get it. <laughs> I get it. I had a client who called me up. The man owed me a lot of money that he wasn't paying. He said, I have a present for you at uh, uh, 33rd and Bird. The pet shop was called, 30, mm -hmm. it's on 3rd Avenue, but they call it 33rd and Bird. Mm -hmm. And there is this adorable little peach-faced lovebird who I called Rodan. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rodan lived at the office and would fly from all around the office to see where I was. So I was mm -hmm. Rodan's partner. Mm -hmm. I love that bird a lot. Very, very nice, very nice bird, this bird. He's very, uh, we call him, we, we, his name is Ridley, but we say he, he is a quarter pounder with attitude. He has a very strong personality. And he's Do they a, clip his wings? Oh, yeah. 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 And whenever Peter brings him to the animal veterinarian, the veterinarian says he's never seen a better tended peach faced lovebird. There a lovebird. He, Peter takes very good care of him. But he expects him to have a fairly long life. And he's, he's a, they have a very good bond. I mean, people have very strong bonds with their pets of whatever sort. Right. Bird. Yeah, I, I don't do avian medicine, so, but I do know that birds, yes, they, they like imprint or bond with you, mm -hmm. and it must be very hard to, um, to take a, you know, a bird out of its environment and make it rebond with someone. Mm -hmm. you know? I, would think. I did have um, a parakeet. A client of mine came and said, you know, I, I said, I feel a little guilty about this parakeet. It's on the weekends I'm not here. I have to, it has no stimulation. Uh, it doesn't have a bright sunny window to be in because it was at my office. And uh, she took my bird and it lived in a cage next to her bird for a very long time. And they finally were able to share the same cage. Mm -hmm. And it was just a little nursing home for my bird. <laughs> <laughs> So, and I also read, didn't I read that, that petting dogs has something to do with lowering your, your heart rate and your blood pressure? Oh, blood pressure, you hear yeah. that, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if the therapy dogs that visit people in the hospitals are, I wonder if they monitor them when that happens, but. Yeah, well, they are letting more and more dogs into hospitals, so they must have some sort of therapeutic benefit. Everybody wants, yeah, lots of people, besides the, you know, the benefits of having a therapy dog that might be able to get on an airplane, um, right, right. A lot of people really enjoy that work, really yeah. love that. Well, I, I was also thinking about planning for, planning for our pets, as you, as you said, having directives or having something in the will or making some kind of uh, benefit for them. But the everyday plans, getting you out of the house, making you walk a certain amount of time, uh, which is good for one's health as one gets older. Yeah, I mean, I have a friend who I call kind of a hard-nosed guy who was raised in a family that never said I love you, mm -hmm. and at 65 got a dog, and he melted, and there's just <laughs> like this gusher of love that comes out of him. He's able to say, I love you, I love you, I love you all the time. Oh, Cover the dog with kisses. Yeah. Dog loves him equally well. It just like, it, I, I really feel like it released this man who, uh, from 65 years of just being a little tied up. No, it's, just, it's beautiful to see. Isn't that yeah. wonderful? Yeah. Under that unconditional love. Well, that's, that's yeah. it from the dog. Right. There's also that wonderful cartoon, I wish I had it, <clears throat> being, really representing being in the present. The, the man and the dog are walking in the park, and you see them from the back. And it's a beautiful park, and it's a sunny day, 
and the man, there's a cartoon bubble over the man's head, and it's thinking about, and he's thinking about money, and there's the music going through his head, and what he's going to eat for not, tonight, and what he's thinking about at work, or what he should be doing that day. And the cartoon bubble above the dog's head is, it's a beautiful day, and it's the park. And it's exactly it. The dogs are so much in the present, and, and what you try to get out of them is trying to be in the present with the dog, right. rather than thinking about all the things you should be worrying about. It's a form of a... That's <coughs> I, I, so I have this experience now. I always took my dogs to work. I walked them to work. That was their walk. I lived close to Central Park, but I never really took my dogs there very often, except maybe on a weekend. No, I have this young dog, and she requires a lot of exercise, and I'm in the park every morning. And um, so are the same people. So it's sort of like you're saying, this dog, I, I see the same people. There's an older group of people who, uh, who are there every morning sharing coffee and talking, and this is their, the way they start their day. Um, so it's not only is that dog good to get you out of the house and walking, but also to meet people. That's I mean, in New York especially. When I moved to New York, I didn't know anybody. I had a dog. And it didn't take long to walk down the street and have people say, oh, what kind of dog is that? Mm -hmm. And oh, where does it come from? And whatever. That's very and interesting, because that, that's true. Because another issue we were talking about, I talked about it in another interview with somebody, was uh, social iso isolation. And, and especially in very elderly people, it can be a real issue. But if you've got to get out there with your dog, you're going to meet people. Right. Because right. somebody is going to comment on your dog, and somebody is going to pat your dog, and, or you're going to meet other people with dogs, and they will have similar issues or problems or a problem that you previously had that you could help them solve. So there's all sorts of social interaction yeah. that can come. No, I, uh, it's interesting because <coughs> it's, just a, it's a, a pan, what's the company that, oh, Pan Quotidian, right? Oh, yes, Pan Right, Quotidian. so down by the sailboat pond, mm -hmm. there are a little stand, and they open at 7, and you can get your coffee, and there are five people older than me. They're there every morning, and they're chatting and chatting and chatting. Mm -hmm. And I have been seeing them now for a year. <laughs> and this is sort of the opposite of what we're saying. They're not letting me in their group. <laughs> but they don't even say good morning to me. I don't, un I don't get it. That after all this familiarity of seeing me walk this dog, the they have no interest in my dog, who's a beautiful dog. Isn't and, that funny? But, uh, that but funny? I do see a lot of other people. And it's, you know. Isn't and as funny? a veterinarian, I run into my clients in the park all the yeah, time, too, course. which is fun. Of course. Yeah, so uh, here I am at 71 with a dog who's going to be two in June, mm -hmm. and I really realize this dog could outlive me. Mm -hmm. I haven't made a plan yet. Mm -hmm. I also realize that, that you know, dog can knock me down when I'm 80 and break my hip. So I've mm -hmm. had older people who insist on getting big dogs, mm -hmm. and that... Uh, That's very interesting, because big dogs in New York need a lot of activity. Right. It's right. hard. I mean, right. it can't. I mean, no matter how long the hallway is, you can't let them run, run up and down that hallway enough to get right. that. Right, and the also y there's no denying it. You do. Older people do get frail, frail and these yeah. big dogs have a lot of strength. And yeah, so yeah. I've I know one of my dog walking friends. Actually, I shouldn't say this, but she had a. She was a dog walker, but she was walking a dog that was way too big, who knocked her down, hit the back of her head on concrete, and mm. this is bad results. Yeah. Very bad results. Yeah. I've also had people. You know, in rent stabilized apartments, and they get a dog and they live in th on the third or fourth floor and they mm -hmm. stay in that apartment the rest mm -hmm. of their lives, yeah. and then they're aging out and they really have a hard time getting that dog yeah. up. And the dog's aging out and can't get up the stairs. Yeah, no, that's very, very difficult. Yeah. I, I've always thought, even in New York, I'm, it's almost cruel to have a very large dog unless you're planning to get out and run around the park. There was a period when I was jogging up, up and down the park where I used to drop my children off on the Upper West Side and jog home. And I took my miniature poodle, not Bo, with me. And we would jog around the reservoir and down and home. And invariably, I'm not, I'm not a fast jogger. I was a slow jogger. And invariably, I would have people stopping me and telling me I was going too fast for my poor dog, who was perfectly fine. My mini right. large miniature poodle would have run, run ahead of me had I right, let him. Would, yeah. But there's so many people with opinions about oh dogs. Oh my God, yes, especially weight. <laughs> Uh, your dog especially is too fat, not, your dog is not too being thin. neutered. If somebody mm -hmm. follows a male dog down the street and notices that he's not been yeah. neutered, there are people who will you know, verbally that. attack you for that. Is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah well, I you're hear contributing it all the time. to the over. Or you're in the elevator uh, and someone will look at you and look at your dog and say, Do you know your dog has cataracts? <laughs> and, I mean, you know. Well, no, I don't know that. I'm a veterinarian. I haven't noticed that. Yeah, well, I mean, my clients come in and say, Does my dog have cataracts? I was told in the elevator that it does. <laughs> no. Well, those are, those are one of the tales in your Tales of the City, though, that particularly struck me, but speaking about, you were talking about the man who finally was able to show love. One of the tales was the tale of redemption, 
So I love it if you talk about that. It was the person who James and his James the homeless person? Right, 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 right. Yeah. And you first encountered him. Tell, well, just tell that story. It was so beautiful. He yeah. was so like the dog in the in the shopping cart. I was um, walking to work, and or maybe I was riding on my bike. I used to ride uh, my bike to work, and I used to take my dog. My had a little Bichon Frise, and she'd sit in the basket, and we'd ride to work. And we, I was walking down the street, and there was this homeless man with his push cart and filled with stuff overflowing, and a dog sitting on top of it. And he's walking in the direction of my office. And I said <laughs> to my dog, I uh -oh. think that this guy is coming to see us. And indeed he was. And he, you know, was a young homeless man, and he had a very young dog that he called Susie. And he said, you know, he sleeps in the park and that he had his plastic styrofoam container with food and he woke up to see this dog trying to take his styrofoam container and that's how they that's how they met and so he fed her and they lived in the park and he wanted to do the best thing for her and so he was bringing her to me for a checkup and shots he knew she needed shots and, and he was prepared to pay um but i I felt like I can't charge this guy. I mean, I, you know, I let me let me do my little bit of charity work, and right. so um, he got his shots, and he went back, and he needed shots every three weeks until the dog was 16 weeks of age, and he would come, and we'd have a little conversation, and over this period of time between giving the dog shots and finally spaying it at six months, there seemed to be this transformation, and um, he had met somebody because of the dog. He was, so there was a person who came to him every day and brought him food, a young woman, and they bonded and he went on to find a job. The last time he came to me, he was dressed in khaki pants instead of rags and <laughs> he had a, was getting a job and he was marrying oh, and moving out, outside of the city. Mm, that's okay. yeah, he had, he had been redeemed yes, by yeah, Susie. By Susie. Yeah, it's Susie. Amazing. What a lovely story. Yeah, it was. It was. It's so nice. Yeah. What a nice thing to happen. So he, so Susie planned his life for him, or, or helped him plan his life. Uh, yes. It's amazing pulling yes. it all together. Yeah, and they were. I mean, it's a cute, cute dog, cute mixed breed dog, like mm -hmm. middle sized Labrador, black Labradorish. And he actually, when he got cleaned up, he was a nice looking guy actually, mm -hmm. and seemed like you know anybody you'd meet on the street once mm -hmm. he was got it's past that. Some, yeah. Things can, circumstances can make people homeless in the weirdest way, I think, right. these days. And, but, I, but it was a lovely story and lovely that he pulled it together. Well. well, I guess the other thing that comes as we get older, back, getting back to that topic with pets, is, is the cost of maintaining pets. I mean, we have health insurance issues for people, and we have health insurance issues for pets. And, and I, guess we have, I have health insurance for my pets, and I remember once my husband saying, look at this health insurance premium, are we really, is this wise for us to do? And as it happened, a few months later, my dog, my poodle, got into a dispute with a much bigger mixed breed dog over a toy. And the result of that dispute was the mixed breed dog took a chunk, mm. cra crushed Bo's forearm mm. right here in such a way that he had to have it in a external splint for about four months, and the whole cost of the operation, the splint and the works was something like $8,200 up wow. on the Cape, big bucks. And luckily we had insurance, we had pet plan insurance, which paid all but, I think there was, ultimately cost us about $1,100, and pet plan paid the, rest, paid the rest of it. And I was so grateful that we had paid that premium for right. that. But because pet, pet cost, veterinary costs are very high. But with him, it was an extraneous thing. It was a single thing. He was cured. I had another poodle who, at the age of 13, developed a cancer in his muzzle. And that was not something that was operable. And, and it could have been treated with chemo, but the chemo results were dubious. And even had he had beneficial results from it, it only would have given him a certain number of months. So the decision was made not to undertake chemo, but he had to have I don't know, $2,000 CAT scan. It's a very expensive stuff. Yeah, right. So and also that brings up that point that you say that dogs live in the present because when you have to make those decisions, I always think, yes, we want that dog with us forever and ever, but that dog is not thinking, oh, I can't wait for it to be spring. I can't wait to go to the beach again. That yeah. dog is living in the present. And to continue to live in the present and not live an optimum life or you know, half a life is 
uh, you know, it's just one thing you have to like take out of your mind. They don't think in the present, and yeah. so to be miserable. Uh, I mean, they live in the present, and to be miserable in the present is just not for a good our thing. sake. Because yeah. we, right. we want them around, right. and that, right. that's why we would be doing this. Right. We would be putting them through this for our sake. Which so insurance. I, I, fortunately, in my life, I have not. I have lots of insurance for this or that, but I have not had to use it. I mean, you know, car crashes or fires in houses and things mm -hmm. like that. I I haven't had them, and so all of the people who I meet who have insurance in my business. You know, they each have an opinion and sort of depending on the insurance company and the level of insurance that they purchased. I have people who say, you know, they got $40 out of a $800 bill and I have people who just say just what you said. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, but veterinary medicine is, is very costly now. I mean, uh, we can do all the things to pets that we can to people just about and uh, those tests cost a lot of money. Um, so you can, I've seen people spend $25,000 for a negative result in mm -hmm. you know, one of those specialty places. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't their fault, it was a negative result. The people kept trying and the bill kept building up. And, mm -hmm. so, I think and so in, in considering pet's health, I think you're right though. You have to really consider what, from, for, is it for me that I want this dog around? And what, kind of, what quality of life is the dog or cat experiencing that, it, that is justifying my wanting the dog's presence that much longer? Right. Um, which is, you know, I, I, I just say that pe pe poor, pe poor people can't afford to own dogs. Hmm. I mean, I don't mean that, but hmm. I mean, that's what it seems like. Hmm. like it. And in that sense, I guess it used to be more sensible. People just said, this is the, you know, we've come to the end of the road with this pet, which is the painful part of having a pet. Their lives are encompassed in this very short period right. relative to our lives. And, and then we, we have to learn that lesson. Um, but, um, well, that, that's something that you must see all the time too, having to ha having to help people over the hump of saying goodbye to a very beloved member of the family. Yeah, and I guess you know every one is different, and you know everyone has a different way of showing grief or having grief, or you know mostly. Uh, I guess what I I always say I I think if I think it's time, I say I think it's time, but it's very important for me the two weeks from now, you still believe that it was time. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to have any feelings of like, I, I shouldn't have. Or too early. I was too early, right. So you have mm -hmm. to know in your heart that you feel that you're gonna be okay about this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, my, my, my first adult pet was a Sealyham Terrier who was a very long-lived one, a great little dog. She was 16 and when she finally became, I think she became she must have had some sort of dementia because I think that she happens. was finally wandering behind the washing machine. My son found her. We couldn't find her in the apartment. She was wandering behind the washing machine and he was low enough to the ground, he was three, that he could see that, that level and she saw that that was where she was and she didn't know where she was. And that was bad, but then when she, when she got to the point that she wasn't going to eat anymore, we thought this is the time well, for her to say that's goodbye. A, that's a nice sign. I mean, I always say there'll be a, a sign from nature or God or whatever that lets mm. you know that it's, it's the right time. Mm. You know. That they were a wonderful dog though because she, I'd had her for years and she hadn't known children at all and kids finally came along and they're pulling her hair, their ears, they're sitting on her and she was so good natured about it and when she didn't want it, she'd just go under the bed where nobody could reach her. She was never nasty about it, just get out of reach. You don't well, see those dogs very often. Do you, do you, did you know Amber Lightfoot Walker? No, she had a couple of them. And no, she was a great, she was a great dog, my Celia. Really, I loved her. She had a great sense of humor, oddly enough. She would hide. And she hid pills. If I gave her a pill to eat, she would pretend she swallowed it. And then I, f would, I found them under a chest, hidden under a chest behind the yeah. foot of the chest. Well, compliance, compliance is a big uh, issue when <laughs> right. you're well, a veterinarian getting people to you, get the pills in. Letting you think that the pill is eaten and then it's all in the same spot in a little right. pile. Very right. annoying. So Tom, there's one other thing I wanted to ask you about. People talk a lot about whether it's important to make your own food for your dogs these days, or whether food that we get from major American producers is maybe actually made in China and contains awful stuff, or whether canned food is better than dried food. Have you in your practice seen a big distinction among the kinds of foods that, make, that people feed their dogs? And is any of this related to the kinds of diseases that dogs get? Okay, that's a, it's a big that, question. It covers a lot. It covers yeah, a lot yeah. of territory. So let's see, uh, diseases in dogs caused by food. Well, it's what's not in the food uh, that's important. Not so much that what's in it. I don't know that you can prove that what's in it is causing diseases, the preservatives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
But uh, for instance, there was this whole thing about grain-free food um, and uh, everyone wanting to feed grain-free food and there's certain grain-free foods that didn't have carnitine. Carnitine is something that has to be in the food to protect your dog's heart. Mm -hmm. So people like cooking a whole meal of, uh, and not feeding any dog food at all, all the things that we feed ourselves, you can feed yourself everything you're supposed to eat and be healthy. If you fed your dog that same diet, you might be missing some things. Really? So I had a conversation this morning. A woman wants to cook for her dog, and she is cooking for a dog, but she's giving it a half a can of intestinal dog food because the dog has tummy issues. Uh, and I said to her, I, that's fine. I tell my clients, you can feed your dog anything as long as it doesn't throw up, as long as everything's okay, but the dog has to have some dog food because the dog food people have the stuff in it that they need. So is that wet f dog food or dry dog well, food? Well, both, both wet and can have it. So mm -hmm. like I'd love to have the kind of life where I woke up in the morning and took this big sack of food and fed my dog uh, a bowl of kibble, but instead I have this very strong relationship with George Foreman and I use his, <laughs> <laughs> his little apparatus <laughs> very often <laughs> to make her a little something special to make her eat the food or mix in with the wow. food. And so we all get into that. I mean, it's like an ever escalating thing of like, what am I putting my dog's food next? But yeah. um, can versus dry, uh, in cats it might make a difference. Uh, a lot of dry food in cats causes a concentrated urine and can lead to some urinary tract issues sometimes. But as far as dogs, uh, dry food cleans their teeth a little bit. Um, cancer in dogs, uh, it's funny, cancer seems to switch around. It used to be the boxer dog, the boxer was the cancer dog. Now it's the golden retriever is the cancer dog, and it's not because of something that they eat, but it's because of, um, and they're finding that early neutering actually, um, hmm. spaying For and all neutering, breeds, then. Uh, golden retrievers and golden labs leads to hip dysplasia, uh, anterior cruciate ligament ruptures, and uh, lymphoma. Wow. Um, hmm. Yeah. So the things we're finding out about why there's cancer in dogs. And would I say there's more cancer in dogs that there used, than there used to be? I don't really think that. I think there are some breeds that become more prone to having it from either inbreeding or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't tell you any cancer-causing food. I think we all know that the food doesn't come from China now. I mean, everybody's really Careful stamping their thing, food, yeah. saying made in the USA. Yeah. Uh, a lot of food is made in the same vats. So for instance, dogs on hypoallergenic diets who are only supposed to eat salmon or rabbit or something, uh, may find that if they're feeding their dog something that says limited ingredient that has some of those things in it, it's been made in a vat that formerly processed else. beef, mm. and you get that crossover and they're still allergic to their food. Mm. Um, mm. So it's very difficult if you have a pet that's on a very limited diet of that sort, but generally there's no correlation that you, there's nothing you can avoid to try to protect your pet against cancer. But, I but there has don't to be know. I mean, that's so like, you know, it's all out there, all holistic. Mm -hmm. we, are, we have holistic veterinarians, uh, alternative medicine veterinarians, like, you know, mm -hmm. with your dog who, who had uh, growth on his muzzle. Mm -hmm. You know, you could have gotten some Chinese herbs mm -hmm. and things like that. But I'm kind of a regular yeah. MD guy, like, you know, Marcus Welby veterinarian. Yeah. Uh, I kind of believe in medicine and not... Not, not woo-woo. Right. Yeah. And that woo woo. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's a better way to go. Well, thank you again. Thanks very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. And next week, we're going to be talking with Nina McLemore, a women's clothing designer who will be talking with us about designing women and about older women in business. Thank you so much for joining me at the Monday Scoop. And if you have thoughts about topics you'd like to hear, please email me at themondayscoop at gmail.com.